Ooh, red. Okay, we're recording. Excellent. Um, all right. Um, yeah, my name is Dan Ficker, and uh, yeah, my web my presentation here is about handling secure data with your website. Um, and uh, first, I guess we'll just this is a little bit about me. I live in St. Paul, Minnesota. I work at Pantheon as a customer success engineer. So uh, it, I'm one of the many people. If you work at if you use Pantheon as a customer. Uh, that you might get on the, you know, support, answering support questions, or helping out. I'm helping out the team too, the other team members that do as well. But uh, if you don't know what Pantheon is, it's a website hosting platform. We do have a little table out there in the hallway if you want to hear more. And there might be a free, a free sticker or two left anymore. Left. I think they disappeared pretty quick this morning though. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I've been done, doing backend development uh, with Drupal and WordPress for almost 20 years now. Um, and uh, yeah, I've been playing around with websites for a long time, so that's about me. Um, let's see. Yeah, this is just going to be uh, this is just a quick overview of what we're going to talk about, kind of in a rough manner, like kind of what is security. Uh, do I have to worry about security? Um, and then also, yeah, just some of the basic concepts of how to transmit data securely, um, store data securely. Um, and then a few things about just kind of trying to keep your Drupal website secure. And we should have a bunch of time for questions afterwards too. So um, let's see, yeah. Yeah, uh, what is security I think is the first question. Like, and uh, that's probably why you're all here. Um, <laughs> let's see, so yeah, the, I think the, the I, my this is my basic take on it is basically just some of the data that you have on your website is not exactly meant to be completely public. Or maybe it's not data, maybe it's just like when you're using Drupal, uh, it has a content management system in there and you don't want anyone to log in and change everything on your website, only the people that you want. So security is basically making sure that they can't do that uh, and, and that they can't access the data that you don't want them to access. Um, so yeah, not everything is public. Yeah, everything, keep everything that you want to keep private and make sure only the public things are showing to people and that they can only access those. Um, yeah, and then, yeah, it, again, yeah. Most likely, you know, if you're managing a Drupal website, you have an administrator, a bunch of people with administrative accounts or ad editor accounts and stuff like that. You just want to make sure that those people are the only ones who can access those accounts and uh, that there's no way that someone can actually kind of sneak into your website and do bad things um, or get any data that you have kind of in the back end of your website. Um, <laughs> uh, Mike, I just posed this question a little bit. Like, it, security is easy, right? Well, yes and no. I'm going to say yes to a few things, but like, security is pretty much built into how the internet works these days. Um, it wasn't in, in the in the beginning of the internet. Actually, it was more the internet was more about just public web pages, but now it's really built into web servers, browsers, and, and Drupal. Um, and yes, I think it also security is somewhat easy just because there are documentation on the internet of like here's how to do things securely and there's lots of libraries of this is how to encrypt things and decrypt things and that type of thing and I recommend you use those too. But I'd also say, well, security is maybe not the easiest thing in the world either just because uh, there's many ways that you can kind of make things insecure not uh, not intentionally, <laughs> and uh, you know uh, it's it's a good to be aware of and try to uh, do the best you can, I guess, at this point. So yeah, new issues can be found in any software at any time. If you look at if you look at you know your Microsoft or your Apple devices, every month there's some new update, and that's because they thought it was secure, and then someone said, hey, uh, by the way. We found this problem that was that we were able to exploit and do some bad stuff with, and they're like, "Oh yeah, you're right. We should fix that." And so they did fix it, and they sent you the update. Um, and Drupal does that as well to some extent. And uh, but that's the kind of thing that that happens all the time. It's like when you're on the internet, someone, someone, someone somewhere is is trying to figure out way, new ways to kind of get into somebody else's stuff, and uh, and you kind of have to deal with that. And so. Um, you know, there's no, I'd say, yeah, there's no real way to say this thing is 100% secure because there's kind of always the possibility that someone has found a new way to get into it. Um, there's, there's definitely ways to be more, uh, you know, kind of more, more sure that like 
they're not going to be able to get into it. But it's it mostly involves like consulting with lots of people, maybe even offer you know companies like Google and Microsoft do offer like hey if you can find a vulnerability then you can show us that it's a problem we'll give you money so <laughs> you know that's that's one way that they try to deal with that too so um, and yeah if you're writing especially like custom code for your Drupal website um, you should try to do as much as you can to make sure that security is a part of that um, just just to make sure that uh, that you're at least thinking about it but I you know it's all it's also again hard because you're writing it to make the website work and hackers to some extent and malicious people are trying to figure out, I know how, or they, they figure out, I think I know how this website works, but how can I make it work for me? And how can I make it, you know, a problem? Or like, like how can I get in there even though they don't want me to get in there? So it, it's hard as a programmer to also think about, you know, you're trying to do one thing and they're trying to do something completely different with the same thing. And, and uh, it's kind of hard to think in that mindset completely too, but. Um, and then yes, uh, should you be concerned about security? I think my what I just said there was a lot of yes, you should probably be concerned about security. Um, and I'm going to at least give some answers on how to understand that better. And I don't, I you know, I don't think I have all the answers in this little presentation, but uh, at least it's something to think about. Um, and yeah, like I said, we'll have some time for questions too. Um, I think the biggest, I, the biggest part of this here is a few different concepts that are kind of core to the way we do security um, in the, on the internet now. Um, the first one I'm gonna talk about is this public-private key encryption. And so basically you have two different uh, strings of text basically that are kind of like a secret or different keys. And actually, yeah, so one's called a private key and that one needs to be kept secret. And then there's a, another key that's generated with it at the same time called a public key and you can give that away to anyone. And the way that this works, and I have a little diagram on the next screen too, is that a public key, if you, the public key can decrypt messages made by the private key, and only it can do that. Um, but then the public key can also encrypt messages that can only be decrypted by the private key. So um, here, you know, like here's this diagram that might help. I think the idea is, yeah, maybe, uh, yes, yeah, so on the right side is usually like a web server or a web server or like a, a server of some sort where they have this private key and they can keep it just on the server all the time. Um, and they want to send data to the person on the left side, which has the public key. So actually they, they can just even say, here's the public key. If you just tried to send unencrypted data across the internet, anyone, anyone could see that really basically. Any, anyone who's watching the data that's going through the U of M network or, you know, an ISP or even a big router somewhere could be like, oh, look, unencrypted data. And wow, it's got lots of fun information in here. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, I, yeah, that's what you don't want to have. Uh, so the reason that we use these kind of public private key encryption is because we want to have a little bit better system there. So uh, yeah, there's an, there's an encryption algorithm and I'm not going to go into all the details of math because it's very complicated security math stuff. Um, but, but the idea is basically, yeah, if you want to go to a website, say, hey, I want to visit this page on a website, um, what first happens in the browser and the server levels is it actually says the browser, like the first thing that happens is the, is the uh, yeah, the, the server basically says, here's my public key and encrypt all your requests with that basically. And so then it, and then on your computer, you say, take the public key, uh, encrypt my request of like, well, this is the page I want and send it over the internet. Um, and it, when you send it over the internet encrypted, it just looks like random data. And the only thing that can decrypt it is the public key at, or the private key at the other end. So private key, private key, vice versa. It's kind of, if you're going from one way, you encrypt it to send the data the, from the server with the, pri with the private key, you encrypt it that way and then you decrypt it at the other end. But and if you do in the other direction, you do the same thing. It's just encrypting and decrypting only happens between those two. And yeah, if it's done right, uh, you know, the, the biggest thing actually, yeah, is uh, for the most part, the private key has to be very private. And ideally, it would never even leave the server at all. It's, it's generated on the server and it stays there forever. Um, and then, yeah, what happens then is, yeah, the only person you could talk to. So that this yeah the only person that can read and read and understand this information is the person at the other end basically um so it 
there's a, yeah, again, there's a lot of like math and uh, details in this algorithm that I'm not going to talk about, but that's approximately how it works. Um, and if you want to dig into more of that, I'm sure <laughs> there are many resources online. And it, it, there's a bunch of different ways to do it, like different types of encryption algorithms and decryption algorithms, and, and they keep updating over the years. Like, um, I, I'll just mention here too that, yeah, the most common example of this, which I was just talking about to some extent, is HTTPS web pages. I, these days, I remember a day, you know, days 10, 15 years ago where most web pages were not HTTPS, they were just public web pages, HTTP, and uh, it didn't require HTTPS to look at the website. Um, I don't know, is there any more seats over here? <laughs> so people are standing up over there, but yeah. Um, but yeah, there's a few. Uh, anyway, yeah, I, so web pages these days are almost always HTTPS, and that's a good thing, because before that, you could maybe say, or you know, before that, basically, if you were sitting in, you know, like the U of M public Wi-Fi here, um, there actually is a possibility with just U of M public Wi-Fi that someone could be looking at the at the uh, someone could be looking at the information going through the air and the Wi-Fi, and they could be seeing like, oh yeah, you went to this web page and you went to this server, you know, um, that's a possibility. But because HTTPS is involved, that is encrypted from my computer to the server. Um, so they can maybe see what server I went to. But at one point, when there was no HTTPS, they could see everything about that web page. They could see which web page you were visiting, what exactly was written on the page. They could maybe even do something nefarious like inject more information into that web page. Um, and so that's why, you know, in the last decade or so, Google and some other companies who run many of the browsers have been saying, hey, we should make it very easy for everyone to have HTTPS on all their web pages. So the first version of that was called SSL, and now it's called TLS. It's kind of the standard for encrypting and decrypting data on, on the websites, um, you know, when, when sending it to, to a website. So the good thing is, I think, yeah, it's even using a public Wi-Fi, like, let's see, yeah, actually, yeah, if you're using, like, the U of M wi guest Wi-Fi is public. There's no password for it. And that does mean that, yeah, other people could see what you're doing if it's not encrypted over HTTPS. Um, there are other versions of Wi-Fi where there is a password where it could actually have an encrypted connection between you and the Wi-Fi router, um, but the U of M Wi-Fi doesn't have that. Your home Wi-Fi probably has that. So um, that's an, and it uses a similar type of encryption, I believe, public private key encryption. Um, but yeah, so then yeah, again, yeah, HTTPS. It's basically doing uh, doing this public private key encryption to make sure that. No one else can understand and see the majority of the information that you're submitting or browsing on the website. Um, another way, another place this is used also is with SSH keys. If you're a web developer, use SSH at all, you might recognize that uh, on your local machine, you've created a private key that will never leave your machine. Or in some cases, even actually, this private key is stored in a little like USB device for extra security. Um, that way, it can't leave your machine. <laughs> um, or it can't leave that device. Um, but then you give GitHub and other places, other places that you want to connect to XSH, you give them the public key. And then that information is used to encrypt the data back and forth. Um, the other thing that's kind of cool is also it says, well, OK, if you've got this private key and you can encrypt and decrypt data from this public key, then you must be that person or that account, um, assuming that you you know are not giving your pub private key out to everyone, which you should not do. But if you did, then anyone would be able to, be able to, uh, to access your account, which would not be a good thing. So hopefully that makes some sense. Uh, the other main security in concept, which I guess I, I should rewrite this maybe a little bit, but yeah, I said one-way encryption. It's more what we call hashing. It's not really encrypting data in a way that you can decrypt it. It's a one-way process. Um, it's, yeah, the idea is, like on this picture on the, on the right here, I put in the word password and I ran it through an SHA 256 encryption algorithm and I got this really long hexadecimal string of nonsense. Um, and what actually, yeah, I'll talk about it a little bit, a little bit more, but what, this is actually what Drupal does when you put a password in to Drupal. Um, it basically does a version of this where it, it just doesn't actually store your password. It actually just 
does this hash thing that says, this is a version of your password uh, that I can't go back to find your password. But if you put the same password in again, I'll do the same process. And if they match, then then you're good. Then, then you did log in. Um, so yeah, let's see. Uh, yeah, so again, the, yeah, the process is re irreversible. So if I have that hash at the bottom, I don't, I don't have an easy way to say, oh, that means they had the password password one. Um, but if I, you know, if I knew, if I tried guessing password one, and I found, oh, hey, look, the hash number match, the hash number matches, then oh yeah, okay, then we, then I know what it was maybe. Uh, the other thing that can happen is because any sort of text you could give it a text text thing that's like three letters long you could also give it a file that's like gigabytes long it's going to always generate a hash value of the same size and so there's a possibility that like if you put in like i don't know yeah it's if you put in like two of the same or if you two put two different inputs in you might come back with the same hash result um so it's, it's not a guarantee but it's you know th this this hash thing is like 256 bits long you know uh which is a lot of data i think that means that the yeah the 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 likelihood of a of a of a collision of that sort like that two things would be the same as like 2 to the 256 which is like a huge number it's like trillions and trillions and trillions of you know of, of combinations so the idea, yeah, when at one point, like the internet would use more a smaller number just because it was easier to store, and it was maybe more likely than like, oh, yeah, you might have the same thing because it was only a 32 bit, and now everyone's saying, hey, we have more data storage, let's use 256 bit or 512 bit actually, and we'll see on a couple screens from now. I do have, I did look in the code in Drupal, and it does use a 512 bit hash, so um, it's big. Um, yeah, <laughs> so it's a, yeah, it's a big, it's a big, uh, thing. Uh, yeah. And then, yeah, one thing I, I've noticed too is like, yeah, if you, you play around with like a hashing algorithm thing online, you can, you can find the web pages for it or you can just do it in your code system too. Uh, it, even if you change one character, like the majority of the characters in the hash will completely change. So, um, that's, that's one thing that hashing has also been used for in the past. I remember in those days when the internet was not as reliable as it usually is these days. Uh, if you downloaded a big file back in the day when dial-up internet was not so reliable, they would say, hey, you know, especially Linux websites and stuff would say, here's the hash file uh, or the hash number. And so you could actually say, hey, did it download correctly? Because if the hash, if the hash va value matches what it's supposed to, it, it means that every single byte in that file is the same as the it was from the server. And if it wasn't, then it probably won't open too, but you know, <laughs> it's another way to verify, like, oh yeah, this thing worked correctly. Um, I remember those days when, yeah, the internet was a little less reliable. Um, I always see the hashes, I never knew what they meant. I yeah, so I that's what it is, is basically you can say like, I knew it was some you, you know, sort of verification. If, yeah, it, it basically just, yeah, reads the whole file and then says, this is what I got from this thing using a bunch of complicated algorithms, I guess. But it's, it's a pretty standard algorithm, and so, yeah, you could do it on your computer, you can do it on another computer, that's what you get the same same result. I suppose there. it yeah. used to be a CRC. Today, it's a, check, a SHA checksum. Yeah, yeah. And that's kind of the same, yeah, that's what it, it basically is, yeah. It's, yeah, and so, what I did look into a little bit here, and we can see a little bit from the screenshot I made, is this is actually code in a class <laughs> inside Drupal core, Drupal 10, I believe. Um, and uh, it basically, yeah, the, 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 the thing I wanted to show here is basically just, yeah, it's not using, um, it, 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 Drupal is not storing your password. It actually is doing a complicated, a slightly more complicated and better security version of the hashing that I was just talking about. Um, if you do see, look at that, line it says mcrypt or no it says crypt which is crypt function in that class and it says sha 512 so that's the default is like if it's going to hash a password it's going to start with that um you do see a little bit further down there's some stuff there about like oh if it's a Drupal seven site or Drupal six site i think it might be using md5 so let's let them log in that way uh <laughs> so um but you know, I think that, I think there's actually even some code below that that says something like, you know, if they logged in with an MD5, make them change their password <laughs> too. So, 
Um, okay. But yeah, if you wanted to look more into exactly how all this works, you could look into that those classes in Drupal core. But um, how, how does like WordPress and other CMSs? I think it's pretty similar as well. Um, but yeah, again, the the biggest thing I think is uh, yeah is is that, um, and I got a little bit more of the screenshot here of, of the same file. There's another. This is the actual crypt function that that file was using, um, and it it again is doing it's doing well. Yeah, one of the things it's doing here too is it's actually putting a thing that they call a salt into the hash, which is uh, the idea there is. If everyone had the same password on the website, or if two or three people had the same ha password, if you just run it through the hash function, it would just all the all the hashes would be the same, right? What the salt does is actually say, for this password, we're going to have a little bit of extra random data in there, and we're storing that as well in the database. Um, and so what that makes it harder to do is like, you know, when you're saying, oh, I want to check if this password matches, you have to actually run the the hashing algorithm with that actual extra salt data. And then, yeah, the the thing that is, uh, sorry, yeah, the 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 thing that salt makes it harder to do is so that you can't actually, you know, like hash the one password once and be like, oh look, five accounts have the same password. You'd actually have to hash it for each one separately and say, okay, I've guessed the password for this this account, and then I can guess the password for that the next account. Um, and you have to do them each separately. So if you if someone did get a copy of your database and kind of figure it out. You know, re, re, like looked at Drupal's code and was like, "Oh, this is how it hashes information." They could spend, you know, hours and hours uh, trying to guess what the password is, everything. But they'd literally have to go through every single password, <laughs> um, and they'd have to do it for every single account if they wanted to get in every account. Um, so, you either have to load a lot of computers or take many months. Um, but your question, I think, about WordPress, I think it's very similar, but I haven't looked at all the code um, directly. So, yeah, it's. Uh, I, I think that this is also, I think, probably the best way to do it, um, because really you don't, as the owner of the website, you don't know what their password is. They, you can't, they can't come to you, or someone can't come to you and be like, "Tell me their password." You can't be, you'd be like, "No, I, I don't know." Like, they log in because basically they type in that password for the second time, and we, you know, when they want to log in, and we do the same process, and we say, "Oh, look, it matches." So yes, we'll let them in. Um, but if if it doesn't match, then we're just like, "Ah." Yeah, it seems like it's not the right password, so you must have typed something wrong or something. So, um, yeah, I, I think that's that. The beauty of that kind of security is like you don't really need to store the password; you just need to verify that they know the password, and that's what we're doing here um, with Drupal and this kind of hashing um, of data. So let's see. Uh, take a quick drink of water here. Um, I think. That's that's kind of all the really really sensitive data that Drupal stores. But I think the other question that some people might have is like, what if I want, have to store <laughs> social security numbers or credit card numbers or something in my website? Um, and first of all, I'd say if you cannot do that, that that would be even better, um, <laughs> just because of course, of course. it makes it you know a much of a you know a. You, it makes your that website that much more of a target. If someone says, "Oh wow, I could get a bunch of social security numbers that are going to figure out how to hack into this, this website," and actually, yeah, for something like credit card numbers too, your bank and your PCI compliance things will basically say, "Like, I don't want you to store them either. <laughs> store them on another server somewhere where their payment gateway, where they've done all the hard work and they have the security people." In, to do that, so that's another reason to not do it too, because everyone else says this is not a way, good way to do it either. If you can, um, that's why Stripe is so successful, right? Yeah, Stripe, Stripe, <laughs> Authorize.net. You know, like they, they've said, we figured out all that security problems. Let us handle it, and I'm like, okay, great. Let me. <laughs> I don't really want to handle it myself either. So, but then, yeah, but like I was talking about a little earlier when I said security is somewhat easy, is there are. Um, you know, open source libraries. There are code out there that says, "Hey, we've we you know use this algorithm for doing your encryption. Use these functions for doing your encryption." And actually, even when we were looking at Drupal there a few slides ago, it does use just a PHP function called hash that, and it says, you know, use the SHA two fifty six algorithm basically. Um, and so Drupal is also just using. The functions that are stored. In, oh, I went too far. So the functions that are stored in Drupal, 
or in PHP. It's not writing its own encryption function. Um, and the, I think the reason, and the reason I recommend you don't write your own encryption function is just because <laughs> if you write your own, then you're responsible for making sure it's, it's working and that there's not a problem in it. Um, whereas if you use the ones built into PHP, other people have looked at it, tested it, and done the research to verify that you know it's not going to have a major problem. Um, some people yeah, have gone to the lengths of trying to write their own encryption or decryption system and then find out, oh yeah, there's an easy way to kind of sidestep half of the things that it, it's good for. You know, it's not, they haven't done the math right to determine like, yeah, it's not easy to crack or something. So, um, and then those things also keep changing over time too. Uh, you know, yeah, 10, 15, 20 years ago when Drupal started, an MD5 hash, which is a lot smaller, it's like a 32-bit instead of a 512, is was what considered like, oh, that's plenty. And now it's like, oh, actually, we can decrypt those in, or you know, we can run those hashes a million times in like a few seconds. And so it's like, well, okay, maybe we can't use that anymore. <laughs> so those things do change over time. And um, the, the more you can kind of use the standard libraries uh, that do this if you need to do it. Um, the one thing I will, yeah, I will mention here too, there is a module called encrypt module that provides some APIs for encrypting and decrypting data. So if you do need to store some really sensitive data in your database, that might be a good way to start. Um, and like I said earlier too, just yeah, hackers do think a lot different than developers. You're just trying to like store the data that you want, but the hackers are like, how can I get that data? And you kind of, I, I don't always think in that mindset, I guess. <laughs> Is like when I'm developing, like how do I make sure that they can't? And you, there's no, there's not like that you can think of everything that they're going to try. So, um, yeah. I was going to say, they're also trying to see if they can get you to store some data for them. Oh, yeah, that can happen too. Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, actually, that's another, that is a good point. Uh, sometimes I've come across to sites where they're like, what is all this stuff and uh, in our uploads folder? And I'm like, oh yeah, well you have a web form where they can upload anything they want. And uh, as people are gonna use that to, and if, if they can figure out that like, oh, that puts a public file on your server when you upload a file, like they're gonna use that to host files on your website. Yep. And that's another thing to be, yeah, be very aware of insecurity is like make sure that they can't do that. Or if it, yeah, if you're uploading files to the website, it should be in a place that's private and that not everyone can see, only the people who are admins of the website. Um, so that's, yeah, because otherwise, yeah, they, if, especially if they can upload PHP files or HTML <laughs> files, you've definitely got a problem there because uh, they are going to, somebody's going to figure that out and start using it to try to like, yeah, put bad files on your server and run them from your website. So, yeah, that's. So, so how do you handle that? What do you do? Uh, well, so, like, Software like WebForm and just Drupal's kind of node forms in general does have a way to say, hey, store this in the public files folder or the private files folder. You want to store it in the private files folder. But if you, you know, it, sometimes people misconfigure it and just store it in the public area and not realize it until there's a bunch of files on the server that they didn't upload themselves, but their customers or their visitors uploaded that are malicious. So, um, yeah, but there is ways to yeah, go into the configuration and change change that to store all the new stuff in, in the private files folder. You remove the old stuff. So, um, yeah, a few other things about security too. Um, yeah, there's on Drupal.org/security. There is the latest security uh, notices. Uh, just there is a security team within Drupal, uh, the, and they they just are like people notify them and they, they look for. Uh, as they can, I guess, uh, <laughs> is security vulnerabilities on, on modules and Drupal core. And as soon as they are aware of something, they try to work to get a, a solution for that and upload the or up to update the module and the and the code with the latest version. But they also do post those, you know, notices like here we updated this and this is why. Um, and so that's a good way, place to look at. And there's there's some also links on the side too of like how the security team works and some of their policies and stuff like that. One of the things I'll rec recommend here too is like this is a, on the right side here is a screenshot of the bottom of a module page. It has different versions of the module for different versions of Drupal. Um, but right above their listing is a little gray shield and it says like if the shield is here, that means the security team will be notifying of us if there are, <laughs> you know, or, or will be providing security updates. Um, and so they work with the developers of the module for that. 
Um, and then it's also, yeah, it's a stable version of the module. I, you know, it's, it's possible that alpha and beta and dev versions of modules uh, and code just don't have security fully in mind as well, as well yet. And also, yeah, just because it has this shield and doesn't mean that everyone's looked over, or that doesn't mean that every single line of code has been like perfectly looked over and from a security standpoint. So there still could be some security problems, but the idea is if someone comes and says, hey, I've noticed a security problem, the security team does take that seriously and should hopefully update it. Um, another few things too, uh, yeah, the security kit module is another one, sec kit. Uh, it just provides a few things, mostly like HTTP or headers that can be set by Drupal to say, hey, make sure that you're always using HTTPS and make sure you only load images and scripts and stuff from our website and stuff like that. So that's some other things you can configure to make your website more secure and make sure that nothing is running on your website in the browser level that could compromise your website. Um, and then, yeah, again, <laughs> well, I, I, maybe I didn't say that already, but yeah, Keep your website updated, up to date, uh, if you can. Um, I know that. Let's see. There, there's. <laughs> you could also deploy updates like every day, and that's maybe a little overkill, and it's going to give you a lot, a lot of work to work on. But you know, uh, just at least every month or so, I'd recommend you know trying to make sure that your website is up to date. I know that can be that be can be tough, but I think. Um, especially the ones that say they have a security update, but even the ones that maybe don't have a security update, they could improve the site security performance, that type of thing. Um, you, of course, when you're doing updates, you want to test to make sure that that doesn't break anything else on your website. But um, yeah, it, what what you do see somewhat often is just somebody hasn't been updated in a long time. You know, Somebody finds one of those security up, security, security vulnerabilities and starts exploiting it and get getting some information. Um, well, I don't know. I don't think it happens too often. But anyway, I, I guess, yeah, that's mostly what I have. Any questions? I have, uh, does yeah does this uh, Drupal since they have a security team can they generate their own incident numbers? I just uh, uh, I learned recently that yeah so there's a common vulnerability that's CVE that's, um, mm -hmm. that's kind of like a I think there's some sort of government ish agency or something that kind of it's just, issues those CVE numbers. I don't know. You'd have to look. I guess um, I think I think they do have those types of numbers uh it's just something own. i believe they do okay. yeah i i guess i'm not sure i know that that's changed over the few years like now there's so many of them issued and like i don't the kernel, know yeah. the linux kernel team only just asked if they could become a person who can generate their own numbers yeah yeah i don't know how that process works i guess i was going to okay. see if i could click on this link but it's not it's loading now not, yeah. they might not have that there but yeah no, oh, and I right. opened my. Have a lot of <laughs> I opened the wrong browser. Yeah, um, let's see. I'm gonna. Yeah. Anyway, no. <coughs> that was my. Yeah, that's my work browser, and I have way too many tabs. You're right. Um, <laughs> uh, I should. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, they they kind of give this own, their own kind of like security advisory numbers. This is the security page. Um, oh, I see. But I don't know if I see. I don't know if I see a CVE number right on there. But okay. I okay. I think for some yeah Joe. Sure. So the security team will they can't generate their own CVEs, but they can get them issued, and they will okay. for any core okay. security release. Okay. Uh, for individual modules, it depends on the severity. Um, but yeah, there are CVEs issued for. This one has a CV here, yeah. Okay. So this is a critical one from last year, last fall, about a year ago. So, yeah. And so thanks, Joe. Thank you. <laughs> um, there's always a few. There's a mailing list you can sign up for on the Drupal Security yeah. page. That's really good. It's you only get a couple a month, and it's basically all the, the high, big vulnerabilities. So. Yeah. So yeah, this especially on this like right sidebar, there's a few things like here's how the security team works, and I think yeah, there somewhere is a listing. I don't remember where that. Yeah. One for Red Hat, but that was years ago. It's the um, trying to figure the sec kit module. Yeah. Is that like a no brainer, or is there any reason not? It's all out. Um, I think it just it just helps. Uh, let's see. I mean it. It, it just helps you do something. Oh, I didn't spell it right, apparently. Um, oh, I did projects. projects. I, 
I have too much fun typing URLs in. Uh, instead of clicking on links. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it, it mostly helps you set up those like CSP securities, like CSP, what is it? Yeah, content security policy headers and other like things. So it, it talks a little about here too, like a list of like, here's a bunch of headers. Like we can help you set up the content security policy via like the Drupal admin screens, but then it also will help you set up like strict transport security and some other things. Uh, so One thing to like, note is like some of your hosts might help this too, but you could also sure. maybe put all this stuff, you could enter these headers in with a module or theme that's custom to if you like. So yeah. I think there's a few different ways you could do it. So it depending on, might not necessarily be like a drop in, like you might, right, have, it could be breaking some stuff if you're a Right, well yeah, if content security policy is one of those, it's yeah. a complicated header where it's kind of saying, I'm gonna, instead of saying load anything that the web page asks for, only allow it to load things from these other remote servers. And so if you just turn that on and say just only load stuff from my website, you'll suddenly see, oh, look, Google Analytics doesn't load and, <laughs> you yep. know, uh, Facebook social things doesn't load anymore. So you want to either whitelist those and build the content security policy correctly or just not do it, um, I think. But, yeah, a lot of people say, hey, you should do it just because if someone is able to somehow inject something into your website, it'll still if they're trying to load something from a remote server, it won't actually load that, um, which is better for security. So, right. yeah. Uh, earlier, you mentioned the encrypt module. Yeah. Uh, I looked up its project page, and it says that a additional contrib module for uh, the encryption method needs to be added. As oh well. yeah. Is yeah. there a particular Sorry. method that's better? Hmm. Oh yeah. That's a good question. Uh. I haven't actually used this module too much uh, myself, but uh, that's a good question. I, I don't know if the module, yeah, I don't know. I think so. The, I think some of these modules that are listed right here that integrate with Encrypt are various encryption versions, like this AES and that type of thing. Um, and that's a good question. I'm not sure. Uh, I think, yeah. I think some of that is to just help enable encryption under certain circumstances. Like I, I need to encrypt field data versus I need to encrypt, you know, some other thing. You know, like encrypt files on your own. Today. Right. Exactly. There's also sometimes like, like if you're working on government projects, they'll have regulations about like you have to use AES encryption or you have to use certain variations. Yeah, there's an RSA algorithm here too, as well as AES. But yeah. So yeah, I, I think maybe they offer options, and you you maybe have to decide which one works best for your use case. But um, I um, yeah. So I don't yeah. I think you'd have to maybe do a little bit more research to decide which one is the best for our use case. Um, and I'm not sure. Yeah, like it probably will change a little bit over time too. Like. Right now, I think probably some there is somebody who will say this is the best encryption algorithm, <laughs> you know. But it, it it could be in a few years like that one's not considered as good or. Um, it, there's been a few times where like yeah, some people have found like some sort of backdoors in the RSA algorithm or something like that <laughs> too. So, you know, it, until they found those, everyone was like, oh, it's solid, you know. And now they're like, ooh, well, maybe. <laughs> so yeah, sometimes that happens. Um, any other questions? Sorry. Um, yeah. So you were talking about the HTTP headers for cross-site stuff. Yeah. Uh, in my experience as a developer, that's really hard to get right. And the browsers every few years will update what they enforce. And so what used to work now is broken. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. So that's a huge pain to deal with. But, um, but my question to everybody generally is for developers like me and simply most of us who don't want to be security experts but really want to have a secure website. Sure. Are there places you can go to hire security experts who can do an automated site and tell you what you need to fix? Uh, I believe there are. I don't have a, like a recommendation off the top of my head. But yeah, I think there are companies out there that will provide security uh, consulting services and um, Does anybody, has anybody worked with one and know of somebody or any, any references? Or? That's, yeah. I, okay. Sorry, I don't have, no, I don't think we have one, but okay. yeah, it's, uh, I, Yeah.
Yeah, I guess yeah. One thing I've one thing I've seen for sure is like like I was talking about earlier. If you you know take orders on your website, there's this thing called PCI compliance, and uh, and one of the things that you usually when you, your bank you know when the bank that you're sending payments to wants you to make sure that your website is PCI compliant and stuff like that, they will usually sign up with a security vulnerability site it's a system where they'll actually scan your website every month or two and actually say hey we think that there could be a security vulnerability here and sometimes I, so I've had that experience and so it's kind of an automated scan where they don't they don't check everything because it's automated it's not a security expert but it is kind of an automated system so it's helpful more than nothing but sometimes it does say hey you know we think there's a vulnerability here and you're like oh well I've already updated to the latest version of Drupal that fixes that and they can't really tell which version of Drupal you're on or something maybe. So you have to kind of work with them to say, hey, I can prove to you that I've updated this and it's not a problem. Um, so I think that's an option too. There are, yeah, I can't remember the names off the top of my head, but if you look for like PCI security scan type of things on the internet, you should be able to find a bunch of places that will at least do an automated security scan. And I bet those companies also might have more of a, uh, a, a, a you know, a bespoke kind of, you know, actual human, <laughs> doing security research as well. So. There are some open source suites too, like um, OWASP has some vulnerability scanning tools that you can run on your own. And they're like free, they have like a whole list of all kinds of free stuff that you can use and they have like their own info to it. Yeah. It's um, OWASP.org, O-W-A-S-P.org, and they have all kinds of free stuff. Yeah. Covers some of the obvious bases and Anyway, yeah, I think <laughs> this was mostly just kind of give you uh, an overview of my thoughts on security, and so hopefully that's at least helpful. I, there's definitely a lot more research <laughs> that you can do to get more into security. But I also just want to mention there's a podcast that I listen to called Security Now, um, and that's where I've learned a lot of this stuff. It's been going for like almost 20 years, and uh, and every week now they used to spend like a couple hours on a podcast talking about like the latest security news and security issues. But the first couple hundred episodes really were a lot more about like how the internet works and how like encryption works and stuff like that. So if you want to, if you got, got a lot of time to listen to podcasts, you can go down that rabbit hole or not. Uh, that was just my thought. But anyway, <laughs> any other questions? I guess we, well, I guess we're about to. But yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks.